Psalm 144 is where we are at this morning. Psalm 144, looking at one verse to set on our hearts and minds for this specific day, that of verse 12. Psalm 144, verse 12. As we consider this Mother's Day, and the mothers we appreciate, it brings to mind the immense opportunity and responsibility given to both parents, but mothers especially for the influence that they have in the lives of their children. Understanding that mothers typically carry a greater burden upon themselves and weight of their child's progression and development. Development in their schooling with the grades that they get looking at every specific symptom when they're ill or sick, making sure they're developing physically, mentally, spiritually, emotionally, socially. Not to say that dad doesn't care about those things, but dad really just cares they're alive, and they're doing just fine, right? That's dad's response. They're fine. They'll be fine, right? That's what they do. When mom is hanging on every single symptom, every single situation, every single grade, with the burden and care for the best the very best for their child that they would have. And when we live in this world that is impressing upon us, especially mothers, what they should be for their children and what they should train their children to be and to do, there's an onslaught of error in our society and we need to come back to God's Word to recalibrate and that's what I want us to do this morning. As we come to Psalm 144 verse 12, I want to ask the question, how do you know how to effectively pray for and guide your child in their young life. This one verse, you might have never read it by itself before or considered how much weight and significance a single verse of Scripture can have in a psalm like this. And so I want to set our gaze upon this this morning and derive some applicational truths from it to best set the trajectories that we should have for our homes and raising sons and daughters to God's honor and glory. Psalm 144 verse 12 says this, that our sons may be as plants grown up in their youth that our daughters may be as pillars, sculptured in palace style. As we come to consider this one verse of Psalm 144, verse 12, we see a prayer for God's blessing on our children through the priority of their growth in godliness. Again, this is a calibrating verse for parenting, and also, by extension, grandparenting. It's going to mold us, and my prayer is that it will mold us as parents and grandparents as we seek to shape and mold our children and grandchildren. Now, Psalm 144 is a psalm of David to protect, to preserve, and to prosper God's people. To give you some context, verses 1 through 11, David expresses his dependence on God in his situation of life. He asks for deliverance from a specific situation and promises to praise God for that deliverance. But then at the end of this, in verses 12 through 15, we see a prayer of covenant blessings upon his people for their obedience to him. Verses 12 through 15 is really a reiteration of Deuteronomy chapter 28, verses 1 through 6, of these covenant blessings of God's people for their obedience to him. Now, verses 12 through 15 talk about various blessings. Verse 12 specifically is about blessings of children. Verse 13, the blessings of food. And Verse 14, the blessing of livestock. And in this prayer of blessings, we see what it does it look like for God's blessing to come upon our children. It's a pattern of a prayer and a shaping priority of what we should desire our children to be and become. It's first a prayer that David prays because God has to work. God has to give the increase. God has to save, sanctify, regenerate, and give the fruits of salvation that come for it. And so we first pray for these things to happen, but secondly, there's application of a shaping priority for our influence. Because while God is the one who saves, He's given us commands in Scripture to follow in faithful influence as parents in our children's lives. And so verse 12 is cleanly divided for us between sons and daughters. And so that's how we'll divide it up this morning. Let's first look at the first half of verse 12, the prayer and priority for sons. The prayer and priority for sons. That our sons may be as plants grown up in their youth. Scripture many times uses word pictures to illustrate the teachings which it is communicating. And the Psalms do exactly that. There's a common theme and image throughout the Psalms when it comes to growth and godliness 
to picturing that of a tree. We don't get too far into Psalm 1 verse 3, where it says, He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. Psalm 52 verse 8, But I am like a green olive tree in the house of God. Psalm 92 verse 12 to 13, The righteous shall flourish like a palm tree. He shall grow like a cedar of Lebanon. Those who are planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of God. Psalm 128, 3. Your children like olive plants all around your table. I'll give you one from Isaiah 61, 3. That they may be called trees of righteousness. The planting of the Lord that He may be glorified. This prayer in priority first for sons is that they are growing and thriving like a growing tree. The Hebrew in verse 12 reads as plants that grow large in their youth, not waiting till they grow up later in maturity, then growing in godliness. The growing starts earlier on. They're stout, they're strong, they're well-formed and established from an early point because of the nutritional growth that they've been given. Now, what is it about a tree that you can compare it in a similar significance to raising sons? Well, they start small trees do and grow tall to provide shelter and shade for others. Trees have a vast root system digging deep and anchoring themselves to the earth to shelter and anchor against storms. Many trees produce fruit to the nourishment and enrichment of others. Trees are a picture of strength. They're a picture of stability. They are a picture of fruitfulness for future generations. Now, these sons here in Psalm 144.12 are likened that to the olive shoots back in Psalm 128.3, but now they're sturdy and well-established. And we see similarities in the raising of sons as similar to a growing tree and how a tree can be stunted in its growth. In a similar way, raising sons can be stunted in their growth as well. So how is it a tree that's stunted? What prevents a tree from growing tall and strong? Well, first, a lack of water is, I think, obvious. Not watering and having access to water. If the soil is corrupted and toxic, it won't grow. If there's too much pruning that happens to its branches, it's going to limit the capacity by which it grows. Not enough space for the roots to spread out will limit its growth. And keeping the structural supports on the tree for too long will also stunt its growth. How is the sun's growth stunted? A lack of watering them in the Word. Nourishing them in the words of Scripture. A corruption in the soil of the home. A toxic environment. Too much pruning, cutting down, demeaning, demoralizing, deflating of words. Not enough space for the roots to spread out in decision-making as he gets older. Always telling him what to do as he gets older, not how to think and rightly guiding his decision-making. Keeping the supports of constraint too long, not allowing him to fail. Understand that a tree, if it's supported by stakes or anchors for too long, it will grow with a narrow trunk. It'll stagnate and stunt its growth. Because a tree needs space to grow. It needs to toss in the wind when it's earlier on, and it builds a bigger base of a trunk in order to anchor it down for future generations. In a similar way, sons, as they're growing up, need to experience the pains and failures of life. I don't know if you've noticed, but all of us are born with a disposition towards pride, especially young men. Much of Proverbs gives wisdom of Solomon to his sons to despise their own wisdom and seek the wisdom of God. How will they know this? How will they understand this? How will they grow in this if they are sheltered from their failures? They need to feel the sting of decision-making and failure while it's small so they learn early and prevent bigger issues from forming later. If you think of the palm trees that surround our area, when a new palm tree is planted, there are the, the wooden stakes and structures that angle out from its base. These are essential, otherwise the palm tree cannot grow its roots throughout the soil. But if the if those stabilities and structures are left on too long, they will damage the future growth of the tree. 
How is it that we raise sons according to God's word? What is the goal that we pray for? What is the goal and the priority that we shape and mold them towards? We desire them to be righteous men of godliness by his grace. We cannot do that in our own efforts. That's why this is first and foremost a prayer unto God to give the increase as we shape and mold them accordingly. So if the goal is for them to be men or trees of righteousness, you then work your way back to wherever they're at in their stage and age of life. How is it that today we can help shape them and mold them by God's word to take another step forward in independence and responsibility while underneath the authority of mom and dad at home to build them towards that man of righteousness? Because there's no such thing as let go and let God when it comes to parenting. Spurgeon said, for what younger men are, older men will be. We see that today, do we not? We see a lot of man children, I would like to call them. Those who have grown in age, but they've not grown beyond adolescence in maturity and wisdom. Because as where they were in boys, so they are in men right now. And so it's simply important we look at God's word in verse 12 here, using this imagery that our sons may be as plants. They're not thorns. They're not weeds that need to be plucked up. They're not a nuisance. They're not a pain in our side. Although sometimes you might say differently. But they are not a withering plant, but they're a growing and thriving plant. Now verse 12 is general instruction. And thus far the instruction's been general, but scripture has more to say on this Subject. So for this and for the second part, when we get into daughters, I want to give three applications from Scripture for how to raise godly sons and daughters from Scripture. First, let me give you three applications for raising boys to take this further. Application number one, teach your sons to grow in godliness. Psalm 1, 1 through 3, blessed is the man, happy, joyful, is the man who walks not in the counsel of the godly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. What does it look like to teach your son to grow in godliness? You teach him to avoid sin at all costs and cling to the word of God. That's the two distinctions we get in Psalm 1. We see blessed is the man who avoids sin. He doesn't walk by it, sniffing it curiously. He doesn't sit in the seat of a scoffer, somebody who's going to teach him disobedience and rebellion. He isn't interested in any of that. But instead, what is he interested in? He gives himself to God's Word. Because understand, church, you can't teach your son to make wise decision if you neglect the source of God's divine wisdom of Scripture. It's like a tree that is going to grow without water in a desert. It doesn't grow. It's stunted. It's stagnant. They'll grow in human age in wisdom and experience. But how Proverbs warns of the foolish men of man's reasoning and wisdom, but the wisdom of God. So teach them and prioritize the growing in godliness. How do you do this? You input God's word, not in a boring, rote way of simple memorization or anything like that. If it works for your kid, great. But there are so many different ways to influence God's Word into your young son's mind. Reading God's Word, listening to audio Bibles in the car. There's so many songs that are rich with verses in them. Again, so much of this, as we've heard before, is not just a simple 2 plus 2 equals 4 formula, and you'll get a godly kid after that. No, this is the influence of one life rubbing off on another life. And that they catch your desire for God's Word. They see how mom and dad are so excited to go to church. They see how mom and dad love to read their Bible, and it has a transformative effect in their life. They catch the fire because mom and dad are red hot with it. Like Apollos in Acts 18, 24, who is an eloquent man and mighty in the Scriptures. He didn't know everything. He had to be corrected, but he was humble to receive the training. But he was mighty in the Word. Teach your sons to grow in godliness. Application number two. Teach your sons to grow in servant leadership while under authority. Servant leadership is biblical manhood. There's lots of talk in this world right now on what it looks like to be a man or a woman. 
There's lots of talk right now in Christianity and evangelicalism about what biblical manhood looks like. It's quite simple. Look at Jesus Christ, the perfect man. Follow his example, follow his attitudes, follow his conversations, follow his demeanor, follow how he lives and live like him. But much of what you find today in secular masculinity is the sort of rough and gruff machismo manhood, which is often selfish and prideful and sometimes even abusive. And so with all things in life, we have to avoid the extremes. So we don't want to go on this extreme, so you swing the pendulum all the way over here. No, avoid both extremes of error and live and calibrate according to Scripture. Perfect balance is found according to God's Word. It's the calibrating tool for our hearts and minds. You don't want to raise up a domineering individual who submits to no authority because he's going to reject God's authority then later on in life. You don't raise a passive individual who doesn't want to step up and lead a future family because he's only ever been led his entire life. Biblical balance is needed. Ephesians 5 sets the tone for servant leadership. 525, husbands love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. Who is the example set for men in Scripture? Husbands specifically. Fathers, it's Jesus Christ and how he loved the church. Us. What did he do for us? Everything. Greater love has no one than this than he gives his life for his friends. Sacrificial, servant, leadership. So how do they learn this? How does a son learn this style of servant leadership? He's not going to learn it in the world. First, by watching his dad model it. In the home and at church, he learns by it by looking at Jesus' example in the gospel accounts, watching how he ministered to people, how he interacted with others, what he said, what he did. Study the life of Jesus for your young son so he can be shaped and molded by the pattern of the perfect man, Jesus Christ. Look for ways that he can serve his siblings. If he has, if he has sisters in the home, great. If not, he can serve those in the church. Look for ways that he can see needs and meet them and point them towards serving in humility, not boosting himself up in pride, but looking how he can give and not take. But it's so essential to develop this attitude of humility early on, to pray for it diligently, to cultivate it as best as you can through your example and the influence of the Word. Because while they may be called to lead later on in life, Their leadership is never autonomous in itself. They are always under the leadership and authority of Jesus Christ. And mom and dad, you represent God as the authorities in your home. So if your sons do not learn to submit to your authority, they're not going to submit to any authority. Application number three, teach your sons to shade and shelter others. Teach your sons to shade and shelter others. They are to be protectors and providers. Just as a tree protects and provides shelter from the heat and the elements, they provide rest and refreshment and renewal. So are men to be protectors and providers. They take the heat from the world so their family doesn't have to. Again, I point you back to Ephesians 5. It's such a formulating text. Christ took on the pains of sin and death on behalf of the church. Sacrificial servitude of sheltering that is here. And it reflects the husband of the father's role to shelter and shade his family. There's a Chinese proverb that speaks of providing shade for the children, meaning that one generation plants the seeds and the next generation enjoys the shade that comes from it a generation later. There's not a lot of shade being found today in this world, is there? Because there's been a neglect of raising godly sons within the church. It's critical this is our prayer. It's critical this is our priority in shaping and raising these young sons for God's glory. More can be said on this. This is not meant to be a comprehensive sermon on raising sons or raising daughters, but simply to set the priority of prayer and shaping influence that we have in their lives. Because verse 12 doesn't just provide this prayer and priority for raising sons, but also for daughters as well. 
We see that in the second half of verse 12, the prayer now and priority for daughters. Psalm 144.12 says that our daughters may be as pillars, sculptured in palace style. It's interesting when you read verse 12, you'd think the examples and the images would be flip-flopped, would you not? That the son would be likened to a strong, sturdy pillar, that the daughter would liken to a thriving, flowering, growing plant. But it makes sense when you understand God's design that he's given in his word. What is it that a corner pillar does? The daughter is likened to a corner pillar in the palace or in the temple. A corner pillar or a cornerstone is the joining of two walls together that is load-bearing for the entire structure. Many times in the palaces or in the temple, there would not just be a joining of two walls together, but there would be a pillar set there to hold the entire structure up, and there would be carved into it images and unique and ornate colors and design and artistry that's built within it. They are for structural of strength and stability. These are pillars of elegance and strength. Like a sculpted statue or a carved pillar you'd find in the corner of a palace. There's been nothing careless in their chiseling. There's been nothing careless in their crafting and forming. In fact, this word here, cornerstone, is used elsewhere in Zechariah 9.15 to describe the corners of the altar. And so when it's talk about sculpting these pillars of these daughters, it's with great craftsmanship and intentionality and strength built within them. Isaiah 51.1 says this, Listen to me, you who follow after righteousness, you who seek the Lord, look to the rock from which you were hewn or carved and to the hole of the pit from which you were dug. These are walls or pillars that are cut from rock to be strength and support for the structure. Now, ladies, I know what you might be thinking. How come he gets to be a tree and I have to be a wall? Like what? What even is this? But notice the qualification of verse 12. This is not just a jagged rock of a wall that's just holding stuff up all the time. But these are sculpted, what's verse 12 say, in palace style. What belonged in the king's palace? Only the most fine quality carved items of strength and beauty. When you walk into the king's palace, you're not saying, wow, look how load-bearing that pillar is. You're looking at the ornate design of the colors, of the image, of the beauty, of the craftsmanship. is more of an art piece than anything else. This is what you'd find in the temple or the palace. It's the perfect blend of beauty and grace with strength and stability. We can see an example of this elegance and strength in Ruth, in Ruth 3.11. Says it now, my daughter, do not fear. I will do for you all that you request for all the people of my town. Know that you are a virtuous woman. A chapter later in Ruth 4.11, And all the people who were at the gate and the elders said, We are witnesses. The Lord make the woman who is coming to your house like Rachel and Leah, the two who built the house of Israel. And may you prosper and Ephraim, and be famous in Bethlehem. Like the two women who built the house of Israel. God's chosen people, His divine nation, set upon the cornerstone foundation of these two ladies. And their faithful influence and strength and stability held up an entire nation. And here we see a godly woman illustrated through Ruth, illustrated throughout the rest of Scripture. Godly woman is to be a strong woman who builds up her family. We all know the influence that a woman can have on a household. There is a saying for a reason, if mama ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. You know this. Why? Because a mother is the glue of the home. She has so much influence to bring everybody together some of you might even be at church simply because mom that's a glue effect she holds a family together 
She strengthens a family together. That's what a corner pillar does. It brings two walls together. It holds it in ornate strength. But at the same time, a pillar can hold up a structure. But if compromised, it can also tear down a structure. Proverbs 14.1, The wise woman builds her house, but the foolish pulls it down with her hands. Just like a corner pillar holds up a home, holds up a palace, holds up a temple, if it's compromised internally, it has devastating consequences to the rest of the home. Paul in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 6, speaks of a compromised woman type. He refers to them as gullible women who are taken captive by a weak mind and are led away by various lusts. They're carried after their own desires. They're carried off by emotions and desires and burdens and lusts and passions. They're growing in the knowledge of everything, but not the truth. They're taken away captive by it. But rather than that, Matthew Henry writes this on this verse. He says, By daughters, families are united and connected to their mutual strength, as the parts of a building are by the cornerstones. And when they are graceful and beautiful, both in body and mind, they are then polished after the similitude of a nice and curious structure. When we see our daughters well established and stayed with wisdom and discretion, as cornerstones are fashioned, in the building, when we see them by faith united to Christ as the chief cornerstone, adorned with the graces of God's Spirit, which are the polishing of that which is naturally rough, and become women professing godliness, when we see them purified and consecrated to God as living temples, we think ourselves happy in them. It's the godly woman of strength and beauty. Inner quality of strength, uncompromisable, Stag, stability, and truth. So what does it look like to pray for this for your daughters? What's it look like to prioritize this in shaping your daughters? I'll give you three applications as well for raising girls. First, teach your daughters to think biblically. Teach your daughters to think biblically. We saw applications come from the trees for sons in verse 12. We can carry some applications as well through the rest of verse 12 for daughters that have pillars and cornerstones. When it comes to forming foundation of a structure, of pouring the cement or the concrete for a foundation or for a pillar like described here, if the cement is too soft and wet, it can't be molded. It won't be able to hold any weight. On the other side of the extreme, if it's too dry and rough, it can't be molded and shaped at all. But there's this perfect balance that it has to be struck soft yet firm. And as it hardens over time, it's molded and rock solid. It likens itself to the soft-hearted woman with tender emotions coupled with a firm conviction of biblical truth as her strength and stability. Again, I point you back to 2 Timothy 3 and the gullible women that were led away by sinful burdens They were led away by various passions, always learning and never able to arrive at a knowledge of the truth. They're led away by burdens, they're led away by lusts, by passions. They're learning everything that the world has to offer them while neglecting the truth. In all these things, they're led away in emotion and sentimentalities, not by the truth. You see, many times we don't know what to do with emotions in the church, do we? I know it's good to have emotions because God created us with emotions. He created us good. But we know that the fall has corrupted us. And so they don't function as they properly should. And so therefore, we have to teach your daughters to think biblically. To understand emotions and what they serve. They are real indicators like a smoke detector with a fire beneath the surface. They have to be talked through. They have to be understood. They should not just be dismissed or suppressed or kicked to the side. But what is the ruling governance of how we make decisions? It's not by feelings, it's by God's truth. It's by God's word. So now more than ever, your daughters are being assaulted in a society that is filling their head with lies. About everything that they have to be, if they want to be successful, and they have to do everything well, and they have to look good while doing it. That's what the world is pumping them full of. 
But is that what God's word says? Again, let's recalibrate this morning. Is that what the word says? No. There's a better way. Something that God has explicitly called for. And there's so much freedom when it's found. Application number two, teach your daughters how to live under authority and support authority. Think of a pillar. A pillar is not the head in itself, but it supports the head and it can undermine the entire structure if it so chooses. Again, I point you back to Proverbs 14.1. She can tear down the entire house. But again, one of the lies that this world teaches young women is that all authority is oppressive and evil and she will find her greatest freedom and joy if she is independent on her own, making her own decisions and living life the way that she wants to in that way. But church, did you spot the lie? Everyone is under authority on planet earth. No individual has ever existed or will ever exist who have not been under the authority of Jesus Christ himself. They may not act like it. They may not live like it. And they bring a lot of chaos and burdens and hardship into their life, complicating the sin within and reaping the results of it. And we saw it from Romans 1. But they're still living under God's authority. And one day, everyone will bow the knee. And if it's not in this life, it'll be too late. So we have to calibrate according to Scripture. Everyone's under the authority. Man, woman, every child. And as man submits to God's authority to lead his home, and his wife submits to her husband's authority and leadership in the home, both excel and flourish in their homes. You see it all the time in the world when these roles get flip-flopped, there's chaos which ensues because it's not by God's design. Ephesians 5.22 and 1 Peter 3, one call for wives to submit to their husbands as unto the Lord, not because he's worth submitting to, but because God is worth submitting to as the authority and as the divine designer. Just as husbands in Ephesians 5 aren't given a qualifications to only love their wife if they're lovable, or they're feeling lovely in that moment. No, it's, there's no qualifications. Love her as Christ has loved the church. She went to the end of himself for her. Similarly, in Ephesians 5 and 1 Peter 3, wives are to submit to their husbands, not simply when they are submittable meaning they're going the direction I want to go. That's not leading, that's you're both going there together. And 1 Peter 3 is also written in the context of a wife, a believing wife with an unbelieving husband, and she's still called to submit in that delicate relationship, but it gives a huge power of influence in 1 Peter 3 that by her faithful conduct, by her humility, by her chaste conduct, she has a power of the testimony through the Spirit to actually open the eyes of her unbelieving husband simply by how she lives in the home. That's influence. And that's powerful. How do you develop this sort of attitude of living under authority and supporting authority? Well, a better question is to ask, how does your, how does your home view authority in general? Are conversations going on in your home that authority has a stain to it and we live the way we want to? How does your family view the authority of the state, the authority of church leadership, the authority of mom and dad as representatives of God in the home? Because you cannot demonstrate a disrespect and disdain for authority in your home and in the church and expect to produce children who will respect and honor your authority. They've learned it from you. And so this comes through Constant criticism, commenting, vocalizing disagreements over preferences is a great way to sinfully influence your daughter against authority. Again, I believe much of this is painted because of unbiblical patterns in the home. Application number three. Teach your daughters to value inner and outer strength and beauty. The focus of our culture is primarily outer beauty, especially here in South Florida where we live. Scripture says you can't, doesn't say you can't be outwardly beautiful, but to prioritize the inner beauty of the heart is greater gain. 1 Peter 3, verses 3 through 4 says, Do not let your adornment be merely outward, arranging the hair, wearing gold, or putting on fine apparel. Rather, let it be the hidden person of the heart 
with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. What is most precious in the sight of God should be the most precious in the sight of God's people and prioritized. And again, if a pillar is beautiful and ornate and delicate design on the outside, but it's structurally compromised on the inside, it's deceiving and it'll collapse. If there's a crack in the foundation of a pillar or a foundation and it's just patched and covered up with paint, it still does not have any integrity and it will fall. This is inner and outer strength, inner and outer beauty. The character of a woman's heart matters much more than the makeup she wears or the designer clothes that she buys. Scripture says, doesn't say it has to be one or the other, but if you're going to sacrifice one, it better not be what's most precious in the sight of God. Again, curls are under so much assault in our society, bombarded with lies, bombarded with manipulation. It's so important to calibrate this with them according to the truth. Again, so much more could be said about this. But this is the prayerful priority of David in Psalm 144, verse 12. Sons are like trees planted in the garden of God. Daughters are like carved corners in the house and temple of God. Both pictures of fruitfulness, of flourishing in the presence of God according to divine design. And it's not surprising that in verses 12 through 15, where, where David prays for the blessings for God's people to come down, that it starts with children and the future generations of blessings they can bring upon future generations as well. Keep in mind, church, this is first a prayer. Because God has to give this increase. God has to be the one to work. These are fruits of the Spirit that are formed and come out of a heart that's been born again by the Spirit of God. God must save them. God must sanctify them as we point them diligently and consistently to the gospel of Jesus Christ where their sinful, condemned heart can be washed anew, taken out in a clean heart, put in to where the fruits of the Spirit can come of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, and the likes of it that we've seen. This is first and foremost a prayer, a pleading, a petition of God. Would you give this increase to my daughters? Would you give this increase to my sons? Would you give this increase to my grandchildren, to my great-grandchildren? God, you have to work because I cannot dictate the results, but you called me to be faithful. And this is truly a mother's greatest prayer. I don't know every mom here in the room as I'm looking around, but I know most of you. And I think I'm safe to say that this is Kids, this is your mom's greatest desire. The greatest gift she could ever receive is to have raised by God's grace a tree of righteousness or a pillar of godliness. To see the increase come into the hearts and lives of her children. That she stayed up night in tears, petitioning and praying for God to save the one who's wandered off. And so I don't know why everyone is here this morning. I'm not naive to think that you're not here, some of you, because mom, and it's Mother's Day. But don't miss this opportunity that God has given you by His grace through your mother, again, faithfully influencing you even by bringing you to church today. To recognize that you might be rebelling against your God and rejecting Him and running from Him, and it's only leading to more hopelessness helplessness and hurt and despair in your life. Remember back to the prodigal son. He ran away trying to fill his, fill his life with all the fruit and the fancies of wealth and privilege and what it could come from. And it amounted to nothing. In his despair, he ran back to his father and was forgiven and restored as the rightful part of the family. That is a picture of God saving sinners as he does even today. That you are not too far gone from God's grace and mercy today. That God is still merciful and kind to intervene if you would repent of your sins and bow the knee to Christ. That by your faith you can be forgiven of your sins. You can produce the fruits of the Spirit that come from it. This is mom's and dad's greatest prayer and desire here to see their children walking in the truth. 
That's why this is first a prayer. But this is secondly a priority of influence. Because as God must save them and sanctify them by His grace, according to His plan of how He works, He utilizes mothers and fathers to shape an influence. Parenting can't determine the results, but you have influence. Just as a gardener can cultivate the ground for greater growth, just like the sculptor can mold the pillar in a certain way, so mothers and fathers, I would say mothers especially by your influence that you have, can influence your children towards godliness, entrusting them to God to save them based on His goodwill. This is our prayer for our children, but as we pray for them and as we try to shape them, we, we can't just look to them. We have to hold the mirror of Scripture up to ourselves, moms and dads, grandparents. See yourself through the lens of verse 12. Husbands and fathers, are you the trees of righteousness in your home? Are you the ones who are providing shade and shelter for your family of biblical refreshment because of your leadership? Young men, is this what you're aspiring to be and to do? Let's set career ambitions and everything else aside in this world. Not that they're not good things, but this is the main thing. Is this your main aspiration? Is this your main goal and priority of your focus is to be a tree of righteousness unto your great God and by His grace to shade a future generation? Wives and mothers, are you the corner pillar of the home, holding them together and supporting in righteousness and in virtue, bringing together everyone for good, not for harm, inner strength and stability by God's grace. And young ladies, is this what you aspire to be? Because the world would have you be very different than this. And there's no accident. Because one of Satan's mastermind tools is to tear down the family. That's why you see roles being reversed. That's why you see everything being flipped upside down and reversed. It's proving the authority and authenticity of the Scriptures. So there have been lies planted in your head that you will be happy and joyful if you pursue a life for yourself in every way, shape, and form, and you're the authority, you're the independent, you're the one. But that's rejecting God's authority. That's living outside of biblical parameters that's there. And Proverbs is explicitly clear. The path of the righteous leads to the shining sun of righteousness, but the path of wickedness leads to darkness and despair. You see, as we pray for these for our children, we also have to be faithful in modeling them and teaching them by our example as well. These are the blessings for a household. This is God's increase that He can give if we pray and if we model, and by His grace, He gives the increase. But church, this is what biblical manhood and womanhood looks like. And our prayer is for our children or for our grandchildren, for our great-grandchildren, that God would give the increase as we use what influence He's given us in this season of life, as they're in our home or still in our lives, to shape them and mold them and point them towards Jesus Christ that by His grace He might work in their lives to produce righteousness and godliness in them for generations to come. Amen? Let's pray. Father in heaven, we are humbled by the task ahead of us. It is easier said than done this morning. We are wicked people, prideful, selfish, thinking we can go our own ways to manipulate the results just how we want to. God, I pray that you'd humble us and convict us how we've steered contrary to your word and the divine, divine design for the home. I pray for our mothers and fathers that you would strengthen them by your spirit to influence their children towards godliness. I pray for grandparents here that you'd strengthen them to be the supportive, nurturing role that they have right now to pray for their grandchildren, to pray for their children, to influence them from afar to best help and provide structure and consistency with what they're seeing at home. Father, we are only able to do this by your grace. This is nothing we can do in and of ourselves. So, Father, we are dependent upon you. 
when we're so dependent upon you for those who have gone wayward, those who have been raised like this verse, and yet they've gone their own way. I pray, Lord, that you would strengthen that mother and father's heart, that by your grace and mercy, you would rescue the sinner home, that you'd bring them back to remember the teachings that they were taught and influenced at the youngest of ages, that you bring conviction upon their hearts, that you give them new life by the power of the Spirit that can work with them according to the gospel of Jesus Christ, that it would be life to them. Help us as a church to lift one another up as we have committed to do with these young families here this morning. That we would lift each other up in prayer, loving one another in a fervent love as you've called us to. That you might be honored, your name might be praised, and you might be glorified in everything here today. We pray all of these things in Christ's sufficient name. Amen.